फोर थ्री टू वन वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड इवनिंग टू ऑल आवर व्यूअर्स ऑफ ऑर्थो टीवी वार्म वेलकम टू यू ऑल वी आर बैक विद द सेकेंड in orthopedics what we need to know this series is being conducted by monthly every wednesday evening with an interesting case presentation followed by discussion in each sub specialty of orthopedics this session is dedicated to the young orthopedic surgeon having interest in each sub specialty of orthopedics with a goal of uniting skill with mastery where the presentation is being moderated by an expert in that field this platform will not only help the young orthopedic surgeons to present their case but also strengthen their communication skills and reach to a broader and more diverse audience through our ortho thereby increasing their visibility and exposure and this will be from under the chairmanship of dr yashas mahant and secretary dr ashish farnis dr shopnil kani and myself dr deepak gautam Dr. Mahanti is the professor and unit head in the Department of Orthopedics at Sir G S Medical College and K M Hospital, Mumbai. He is an honorary consultant at Jaspok Nanavati and Sushrut Hospital. He is the past president of Bombay Orthopedic Society, an academician and a researcher. Today we have three brilliant presenters, one each in trauma, spine, and arthroplasty, with an expert panel including Professor Mahanti himself, Dr. Dira Sonavani, and Dr. Asis Farnis. I would now like to call upon Professor Manthi to introduce our presenters and expert panel and proceed with the session. Dr. Manthi, sir, all to you now. Thank you, thank you, Asis. Uh, greetings from Mumbai and uh, welcome to the you know second series of uh, controversies and consensus in orthopedics. And this time we have devoted this entirely case presentations by young orthopedic surgeons and uh, they will present cases from different branches of orthopedics and uh, there will be expert panel to uh, take you through discussions so whenever you need any co you know questions you want to ask you can put it in your chat box uh, and ask so that we can take these questions as well so today the three case presenters uh, they are from trauma spine and from arthroplasty so let me share the screen So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Pratik Sunil Tauri. He is MS Orthopedics from Bombay Hospital Institute of Medical Sciences, Mumbai. He is a fellow in joint replacement and robotic replacement surgeries and currently working at Government Medical College Nagpur. Dr. Tauri will present a case related to the trauma, and our expert, uh, you know, trauma surgeon who is there today to take you through discussions is none other than Dr. Ashish Farnis. And Dr. Ashish Pandey is a senior consultant in a trauma, orthoplasty, as well as pelvic osteoplastic surgery at Jupiter Hospital Thane. He is a KM Ortho alumni and is a well-known figure in the, you know orthoplasty, trauma, as well as pelvic osteoplastic surgeries. Now I hand over to Pratik to present his case. Uh, can I share my screen? Yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, very good evening and uh, thank you uh, thank you uh, mohanty sir for the introduction and uh, let me kick start this session with a very interesting and a unique case of uh, atraumatic bilateral acetabular fractures this case was done at uh, bombay hospital under uh, mentorship of uh, dr pradeep nemade sir and dr hemant bandari sir so uh, the case is a 73 year old male who was a known epileptic had a seizure episode and uh, followed by which he presented to us with severe pain in the groin region and he was unable to walk he presented to us with uh, this x ray which shows the bilateral acetabular fractures and posterior uh, dome impaction was there the gull sign was present on both the sides so these bilateral acetabular fractures are usually uncommon 
and uh, they occur after a significant high energy trauma and caesar in used atraumatic acetabular fractures they are anecdotal and very few cases have been reported globally so the challenges or the management issues were the identification of the fracture pattern whether to conserve or to operate them and if to fix then what is the key for success we did the ct scan and uh, a head subtraction ct views the 3d ct and the axial and the sagittal cuts they all suggested uh, of identical fracture pattern on both the sides which was posterior superior dome impaction along with the quadrilateral plate fractures we used the anterior intrapelvic approach so do you have a little discussion now the fracture pet uh, fragments yes sir let, let us have little discussion then we can go at the management sure sure sir. right right yeah. so pratik uh, i just wanted to ask i mean he was a known anti known epileptic yes sir uh, do we have any idea what uh, anti epileptic medications was he on phenytoin no uh, he was taking sir that was yeah. I mean, so one of the significant uh, histories that I, I would like to highlight for the viewers and uh, the residents who will be watching is that patients, we have seen a lot of patients who are on uh, anti-epileptic medications and more often than not, a lot of them would cause osteomalacia. So here there is a patient who is uh, in an age group where there will be a lot of osteoporosis and, uh, you know, violent contractions and uh, epileptic seizures or fits. can yes they themselves can cause a fracture maybe after a fall or the fit itself but those patients will also have a tend to have uh, osteomalacia because of the anti epileptic medicines that they are on yes sir so actually this patient uh, after the seizure episode he presented to neurology department and uh, from there he was uh, uh, referred to us a uh, day later right because he was because unable to walk and there was whether he had a fall or but he had a fall there was no fall sir no no sir no fall yes, he was in the bed seizure, during uh, the, the sleep yes sir during the sleep he had a seizure episode and so this is a traumatic uh, kind of case yeah in the sleep in morning case also. he had seizure episode sir yeah we had a similar case a uh, little older patient uh, but same seizure episode bilateral similar fracture pattern okay let us this what is what is galwing sign what, what does it indicate can you just as uh, highlight to for our viewers yeah. yeah so basically i mean you have mentioned uh, posterior superior dome impaction that is one thing the other uh, uh, it 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 is also like a more of a anterior column and uh, uh, there is no extension posterior right is it it's not a posterior hemi transverse or is there no a, sir no so it's the injury is more so in the anterior uh, part and what is peculiar yes. here is that the head will follow the anterior uh, uh, anterior column you know when there is a displacement the head will yes it will go in but it will not stay in the center it will follow with the if you look at the 2d images the head goes with the anterior column you know and uh, as the head impacts because the subchondral bone is very uh, soft and it it impacts in a such a way that it causes an articular uh, subarticular impaction it's more so like an impaction fracture which you would expect in a posterior dislocation of the acetabulum or uh, let's say in a tibial plateau lateral tibial plateau fracture where the lateral dome would impact below so similarly the weight bearing dome actually develops a, uh, a discrepancy or it develops a impaction which looks like the seagull i mean you have beautifully demonstrated the seagull animation yes sir makes uh, yes. you know which one can absolutely remember so here actually there is a problem isn't it as the head would be point loading so even if this gentleman is 73 we would if you leave it alone he will become arthritic very soon yes sir so that is what literature also suggests that uh, even uh, whatever we do there is like the jeffrey angelin paper shows that uh, there is 100% predictability of failure after the galving sign is uh, seen right. and what are so, your challenges what are you thinking 73 year old gentleman seizures not a properly controlled seizure challenges while uh, he was well active uh, no sir actually it was controlled uh, he had the uh, last episode of seizure uh, uh, 
like around a year or two years back oh. it was caesar free episode between and uh, he was well well active patient he used right. to go abroad and like okay yes, so one, we have identified the fracture pattern that yes it's more of an anti column injury along with yes, the fracture sir. of the quadrilateral plate as well and the critical thing here is that because of the poor quality of the bone there is this gulping sign and there is a impaction now this impaction for the uh, for the viewers if you look at the acetabulum as a whole it is more so that on a ct scan you found it posterior superior dome isn't it yes sir so, can, so can, you, can you show the ct scan please that one just to point out just for discussion sake yeah just sure, yeah okay so we can start from the right hand side yeah so pratik you want to take us through uh, which areas are impacted and uh, how it is changed? i think the so sir uh, we can very well see on the 2d ct this yeah. is the superior posterior superior region which is impacted and uh, so uh, these are the head subsection views which are very important to see the dome properly right so we have to ask the ct scan guys in the dicom images they have to reduce the, to subtract the head and only after that we can you know properly identify the uh, fracture pattern right so this is very important uh, because if one is planning to fix then we have to identify the fragments thoroughly and uh, pre planning is very important if this, this type of injuries uh, is what uh, needed so yes, so for people who i mean who are watching also i think uh, here i would like to highlight the difficulty here is if you once you identify where the fragment is then you you need to look for it and locate it under the cm because intraoperatively your cm image of a pbh ap is all yes, you have to do and yes, then uh, so, it, you have to reverse uh, what, the injury mechanism so under cm what view to be taken is is of importance because uh, the view of cm you know we have to take a obturator outlet view the right. obturator inlet view in this is type of uh, injuries to visualize this fragment specifically the posterior superior dome usually the impaction is in the anteromedial dome which is seen by the obturator outlet view right but to see the post, uh, the posterior superior uh, dome the radiology intra op is to be seen by obturator inlet view which is uh, you know uh, the the crux right so now uh, we you have told us that the uh, the results of operative treatment are uh, non operative treatment are very poor sir yes sir but this was yeah, back so, in uh, 2003 sir uh, after that many many modifications in the uh, management have come and uh, being the dome the uh, the weight bearing dome it is recommended to be fixed Okay. Yeah. Because this patient, okay. particularly in this patient, he was very active. He used to go abroad, uh, and uh, he was socially very active. He was even uh, if even if he is seventy two, he is seventy two. Even no? even even see, uh, uh, the girl sign is a prognosticating factor. Am I right, Doctor Padnis? Is a prognosticating yes. factor for yeah. This. Yeah. So you have told about two thousand three. Even there are articles in two thousand fifteen and seventeen. I think by two thousand eight, all some uh, there was an article. This yes, fracture, even after fixation, the conversion to post traumatic arthritis is high. It almost about sixty uh, percent. Yes. Yes. But uh, would you do uh, primary arthroplasty? Would you consider in this seventy-two years old male? Considering the prognosis uh, of sixty percent, you know, uh, bad prognosis, would you consider primary arthroplasty one go surgery or first fix it then later on decide about? Uh, yeah, sir. Uh, for this patient, we now, what you did we will 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 know later. Yes, sir. Let us discuss amongst ourselves. Uh, means, uh, at Wait, least ask, ask, ask this doctor Asit. So thought processes basically, yes, yeah, seventy three. He is already uh, he is an epileptic, mm -hmm. and uh, he has presented to you within two three days. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, I can see that this is Doctor Nemade's case, and uh, if you have, if you can reverse the uh, injury mechanism. So my next question was, yes, we decided to operate on him, and now Doctor Bhanti, as he correctly said, fix or replace. 
so uh, at this stage uh, i would probably fix him uh, with the intent to correct the gull wing sign because now right. we have the uh, means bone grafts and understanding how to you know get that marginal impaction out of the way and also buttress it but uh, i appreciate someone might also want it to let it uh, you know give it a lateral pelvic traction exactly uh, that is another option yeah the another yeah. option what a telling suppose somebody is not well experienced in a pelvic surgery or in a remote place something like that uh, you so, know district uh, uh, hospital where the facilities for doing a pelvic astrology doesn't exist so he could give a lateral they, they, in the in those areas uh, lateral pelvic pelvic traction followed rather by rather than followed rather by than a, ha, rather yes. than bad surgery yes sir definitely isn't it yeah maybe let it mal unite and then you can consider a, a straightforward total uh, hip replacement at a later stage yes would you, would you put a lateral traction which you used to put earlier as is uh, like you know those kind of dhs type of those uh, lateral hip traction yeah so no sir now it is not recommended uh, yeah. simply because the approaches are the understanding of the approaches and uh, we get so many good plates recon plates which are quite strong KJS we get which we can put bone graft bone substitutes which are there so lateral traction virtually no one gives and yeah. uh, you know talking about remote places now there are these the, the association is AOPAS Association of Pelvic Acetabular Surgeons so I know it's a very vibrant body but they have got members in every nook and corner and everyone travels a lot to tackle such uh, fractures yeah. but uh, yes uh, what Doctor Monty said: Instead of a bad surgery, it is better to uh, let do. it malignate, and then you can do a, a hip replacement later on. Yeah. Uh, Doctor Ashish, I have a question for you. For yeah. such uh, uh, acetabular fresh injuries, uh, what is the deciding factor uh, factor to uh, uh, not to go for a arthroplasty? Suppose See, uh, yeah. is, is it a fresh fracture uh, of any kind? That is one thing. Or it's a, it's a, which column is more uh, deciding? So anterior column or posterior column or, or a quadrilateral plane or superior dome. So, yeah, I want your yeah. So, yes, uh, uh, in whom I would not operate is a really sick patient. You know, there are these sick patient, patients who are really sick. Now, he is an epileptic, let's say he's 17 and not the fittest, uncontrolled diabetes, uh, concomitant urinary tract infection, abdominal problems, who will not withstand long surgery or let's say even a surgery which will last for about two, three hours of blood loss. So definitely no surgery for him. The deciding factor radiological will be articular incongruity. The head which is not centered very well. Now this you can see that head is uh, going inside following the anterior column and going with the quadrilateral plate. There is like a hill sex kind of a lesion impaction fracture on the head also which is telling that there is a, a defect there. So radiological parameters and the fact that this patient who used to travel abroad, he was a very active person. Uh, understanding that he went to probably Bombay hospital or from a metropolitan city, he would not want to stay in bed for a longer time and would want to give it the best chance. Uh, he would also be a right, motivated patient would be a right candidate for surgery. Someone yeah. who is 85, 83, not motivated, family, not family. My, my, my question was regarding which column uh, decides, uh, uh, suppose only enter column is there, in that case, you know, fresh fracture can we do, or only a posterior column is there, in that case, the fresh, with the fresh fracture, can we go for a THR? So which column is, uh, uh, should be okay? For a THR? Yeah. So for a THR, uh, it's not mandatory because THR, you, you get multi-hole cups, you have got multiple screws and you can add a plate and a screw both. Okay. So I don't think it will be a problem. A posterior column along with a, a THR also can be done. You treat it like a pelvic discontinuity. And then uh, as if THR is actually very simple because you're getting rid of the head, you can see the acetabulum from inside. You can even pass a, a screw on the anterior column. A posterior column, uh, you can buttress it with the plate and then you can proceed with the hip replacement, use the head for a graft. So hip replacement actually, uh, in the hands of a good hip replacement surgeon, he would make things look very easy. One has to be little experience in fixing pelvis tolar fractures as well as the hip replacement to do this kind of surgeries. Hmm. Okay, that is that is a message should be given. So in a in a... Uh, we, are, we are discussing the best scenario setup and also in a setup where the facilities are not available. So facilities are not available, so we can tell, we can uh, conserve it, uh, let it malunite and later on uh, whatever uh, you know, hip replacement could be done. And uh, surgical wise, you tell that suppose only we fix this fracture, then we will go and fix the anterior column. 
Asis? Uh, yes, sir. So, uh, I mean, there are four things. I mean, Pratik, I mean, as I have uh, been attending many courses and, uh, you know, sort of meetings over the time. Uh, so, I, I've got a good mnemonic. I mean, I, it's not my mnemonic. I have got it from one of the courses which I use. So, there are four T's. T as in uh, timing of the surgery, what techniques you are going to use, what tools you are going to use, and who's going to be on your team, especially when you do these surgeries. So, uh, let's consider what techniques you are going to use. So as Dr. Mondi asked that uh, only, are we only going to fix the anterior column? So you can tell, you can take us through what your thoughts were, uh, keeping these in mind. So uh, with the with the AIP approach, we can definitely ident we can uh, address both the fragments. We can uh, yes. we have a good visualization of the quadrilateral plate. And the superior in the dome, so that is completely you know, well uh, seen, well visualized with this approach. It is a small incision, modified stoppers, a small incision, seven eight centimeters, and both the uh, both the fractures were very well up, up, like uh, seen through this uh, approach. So we fixed like we can fix uh, the co complete quadrilateral plate with the pectineal uh, supra and infra pectineal. Uh, columns we can uh, reduce them and fix it and uh, so yeah, yeah and I think for, you, the, you... for the dome we we have to uh, we, we 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 can put some bone grafts to elevate the fracture fragments like uh, if, if they're collapsed we can elevate them and uh, so structures for the structural support we can put uh, bone graft in there so that is what uh, oh, you have already managed this case? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Now you can go ahead what you have yeah. done. Later okay, sir. Here. Okay, sir. So, then... uh, as I said, sir, we took this uh, modified st uh, stopper, the anterior intrapelvic approach, and uh, the head was lateralized using the stinement pin, and the fractures were uh, assessed by opening with the laminar spreader. And the impacted fragments were visualized. So this was what uh, the view is, the radiological and obturator inlet view intraoperative is the, you know, this, in this view, it particularly visualizes the posterior superior dome, which is the area of interest. Mm. And uh, with that, the reduction was achieved using the bone clamps and uh, the fragment was elevated for the structural support we did, we put it, uh, Tricortical uh, bone graft on both the sides. It was similar, and after that, supra infra pectineal plates were put, and uh, subcondral buttressing screws on both the sides. Similar. Uh, so this is the intraoperative image. Mm, nice. Well, identical fracture and identical fixation. Yeah, in single sitting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So now, which plate is buttressing what? Sir, these are the screws. Yeah. No. So the control you area. You can go to the clinical picture. I'll answer Diraj's question. Yeah. You can go to the clinical picture. Yeah. So Diraj, in the, the image which says the right, uh, so that there is a plate in the top which uh, starts, let's say, from six o'clock position. You can see that it is going on the pubic symphysis on the superior aspect, going over the pectineal laminans. And going all the way back to the uh, ilium and the posterior column. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. The the plate which is the uh, uh, plate which is the, the second plate is going on the posterior aspect of the pubic symphysis, running around the inner pelvic brim, and it is it is pushing the quadrilateral plate outwards again. It is like you are pushing the quadrilateral plate from inside out, from within the pelvis right. to back outside the pelvis, and right. the structure that you can see running. Uh, Pratik, you want to tell us what the structure is which is running across? Mm. The so obturator, not right? Where, sir? Uh, right on side. the left side, on the right side. Right side, there's a structure running above okay. the on the plate. Yeah. No, no, sir. So that is the obturator now. So what is happening here? You are seeing the obturator foramen from the inside. You are buttressing <coughs> the quadrilateral plate from within, and yeah. then you are putting these two screws on the posterior column. So 
uh, it is like you know the olden days we used to use indirect methods to sort of keep this out so uh, in the pelvic acetabular uh, you know jargon they say it is like trying to close the door on the ground floor by using a stick from the first floor but here what you are trying to do is you are trying to close the door from uh, within itself hmm. got it okay. got it. thank you yeah same thing on the right hand side so there are two plates one goes on the pelvic brim and one goes on the obturator uh, right. and puts the quadrilateral plate out and you can see the uh, obturator now the the only dangerous thing in this approach so what has happened is that because this approach has become so popular it used to be an approach for general surgeons but uh, a lot of orthopedic surgeons and pelvic acetabular surgeons have taken it and they have sort of created their own uh, variation this was popularized by claude sarji and uh, a few other people uh, the important structures to remember here is that there is a corona mortis so that's a yeah. communication between the external iliac artery and uh, which goes to the obturator artery so now almost everyone looks for it uh, isolates it and uh, either Thank ligates you. it or Thank clips you. it yeah once you have identified that then it becomes just a blunt dissection and becomes a very beautiful approach so it has decreased the morbidity of pelvic acetabular surgery and you can tackle everything from it i mean there are people now who are even tackling posterior uh, column fractures through this particular approach and putting screws in the posterior column okay so it has nice. really changed our way of looking at things important thing you are looking you are to stand on the opposite side of the patient if you are operating on the right then the surgeon is operating on the uh, standing on the left hand side and trying to push the hip back outside so that is the head on view sir by standing yes. on the opposite side uh irrespective to the iliopractic approach in which the surgeon used to stand on the same side yeah so right. this the visualization of the surgeon is also very the is, is vast you, you have a follow up prati yes sir so this is immediate post operative x ray Uh, uh, these are the obturator uh, inlet views of both the sides, and yeah. uh, then. Do you want to show us the corrected say, seagull sign using your mouse or a cursor? So, in this views, you can see yeah. that, sir. Yeah. 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 yeah the dome. The other side, I'm ah, okay. Fine. So this is the dome. So, so now that's... you can see the hip has come out again. You can see the hill <clears throat> like fusion on both the sides, but the hip has come out. The femoral head has come out, and the seagull sign, which is the arterial depression, that is gone. So if yes. this stays maintained because of the cortical bone graft, then this patient will have his natural hip for the rest of his life. Yeah. So okay. the so... there is a joint congruity is maintained, and joint space is uh, you know uniform all around. So this right. is immediate postoperative X-ray. Okay. Yeah. And uh, this is X-ray that six months follow up. Very okay, good. so nice. complete good, good, good. Everything is fine. We also did a CT scan to see. At six months, we could see a documented, well uh, preserved head. The fracture was healed. It was all good till death. Right. And no. uh, the post-op medullary DFGN score was seventeen, which is very good, considered to be very good. Patient is walking. He is standing on single stands, and uh, basically, he was happy doing all the household chores. राइट साइड वॉज कम्प्लीटली फ्री हीविंग नो कंप्लेन विद सो लेफ्ट साइड डेवलप हिप आर्थराइटिस नाउ and for that we did a total hip replacement surgery intraoperative we could see that the acetabulum there was no defect in that okay. there was just arthritic changes and uh, this is the head photo we couldn't take the acetabulum photo then so uh, uh, how, how many years follow up after this uh, so after this 3 years yeah. now okay. okay he is completely fine pain free on the right side there is see on the right it is still well preserved joint yeah on the left side there are some changes of heterotopy ossification however there is no complaints from the patient recently i called him for the follow up he has sent me this video and the x-ray photos yeah 
great so if you would have done a total lift during that time it would have required cage and some kind of you know other stuff but here it is straightforward primary total lift forward yeah totally top looks little vertical but uh, top was little vertical and other maybe. hip is also saved now yeah other hip is completely completely uh, better than the, the left what are you doing for this ectopic ossification now Suppose you see this injury. Just recently, he has sent me his X-ray. Uh, two days back, I this called is, him. This is Brooker's so, type one. On endometacin and this yeah, Brooker's type one, sir. Endometacin, yes, sir. Yeah, endometacin and yeah. But still, I have seen many ectopic ossification. Even if it is type three or something like that, but the movements are fairly well maintained. In many well maintained, sir. He's yeah. he 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 is current. Uh, recently, he went to Dubai. He just uh, told me he's very happy with the with the joint and the surgery. So okay, so great. Basically, so great. the learning. So this is the paper which I was talking about, Jeffrey mm. Angelen's uh, paper in two thousand three. He suggests predicted that there was hundred percent prediction of failure. However, which is not completely agreed in after twenty years. Mm. And uh, post seizure, there is osteopenia. The, Fernandez sir has mentioned it in the beginning. The important crux is the imaging, the preoperative and the interoperative. The head reduction CT scans are of the uh, importance and the obturator inlet views. And uh, the structural support, we have to put some bone grafts after elevating the fragments and to keep them elevated and peripheral buttress plates and screws. They are of the importance. And uh, we should not hurry in defining our success because till one year everything was good. After that, in identical identical fracture pattern, identical uh, management to that by single surgeon in single setting, one result one hip one uh, side had excellent result and one side was resulted in arthritis. So maybe because of the small uh, maybe because of the avian of the small fragments of the uh, fracture it must be because of the head impacts and during the time of that also no? yeah, yeah. Also the there is a possibility yeah, during primary injury the blood supply was affected but it's always i think preferable to go ahead with fix it yeah so okay whenever it required then i do a straightforward totally replacement yes sir but a great case. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you sir. Pratik, for that great case. Okay. I think you must uh, publish it in the Journal of Case Reports at least. Uh, yes, sir. It's a are, good case for a publication. You have got a good follow-up and all. Thank, Thank you, you for uh, presenting this case. Thank you, sir. If you could stop sharing the screen, we'll go to the you know next. Thank you, Ashish, for uh, moderating this Thank you, Ashish, session. sir. Thank you. Thank and, you, uh, sir. Thank you, Deepak, sir. Bye. But, but we would like to... You yes. to stay here to yeah, discuss yeah. with other cases also. Yeah, yes. yeah, let me share my screen. So let us move by it with the next case, which is related to spine. And uh, <clears throat> we have Dr. Ayush Aryal here, who is an MS orthopedic from All India Institute of Medical Science at Delhi, the former research fellow and uh, ICMR scientist B in AMS Delhi, FNB in spine surgery from Indian Spinal Injury Center at Delhi, and uh, at present a consultant spine surgeon at Knee and Spine Clinic and Apollo Clinic of uh, Chandigarh. He has got the Spinal Cord Society Best Published Paper Award uh, in 2022, and as well as uh, ICMR International Travel Grant from Young Scientist 2019. Dr. Ariel has been a membership of many societies of uh, you know related to spine, ASI, North American Spine Society, member you know, Fidway O Spine, APSS, and Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association, and he has been peer reviewer for many journals also related to spine. Welcome, Dr. Uh, Ayush. And uh, we have, uh, you know, our panel of experts, uh, uh, Dr. Dhiraj uh, Sonawane who is a consultant spine surgeon and uh, is a national, renowned uh, spine surgeon at national and international level. And he is the, you know, associate professor in orthopedics at Grand Medical College and Sir JJ Group of Hospitals. 
Dr. Sunane is an executive committee member of uh, Bombay Orthopedic Society and uh, he is our uh, incoming you know, organizing secretary for Western India Regional Orthopedic uh, Conference as well. So let's uh, uh, you know, hand over to Dr. Ayush to present his case. So good evening, everyone. I'll be presenting a case of uh, some spine pathology. So let's uh, proceed forwards. Uh, thank you, sir, for the introduction. And I'll begin with my case. Uh, this was a 38-year-old male who presented to our clinic with uh, low back pain for around three months. It was okay, moderate type of pain by 6 by 10. But he had pain radiating to the right flank region, somewhere around the lower uh, mid-back on the right side. And uh, that was quite severe for the patient. He did not complain of any weakness or numbness in the lower limbs or the upper limbs. He had no other bowel bladder symptoms, no balance issues. And uh, mostly the back pain and the, that pain radiating to the flank was his main problem. On examination, we could not find any physical abnormality on our examination. No tenderness, no deformity. Neurology was normal, no upper motor neuron signs, and there were no nerve root tension signs in his lower limbs. SLR was negative, power was okay, numb, there was no numbness. So, uh, first thoughts in this scenario where patient comes with back pain radiating uh, in the mid back region and radiating somewhat on the flank. So, we thought it was a muscular pain or could be of a renal origin. And uh, so we advise this patient without any investigation just to go for a conservative management for uh, we advised him conservative management for four to six weeks uh, within two weeks patient returned to us he said that he is not getting better with this conservative management and his pain is similar and uh, then we thought of investigating this patient so uh, are you sure but, uh, yes. just to stop you so uh, what was the distal pulsations like Distal pulsations, sir, actually in the first go, we did not check because it seemed a very benign case, but it was okay, sir, later on, like retrospectively speaking now. It, there was, uh, okay, okay. Yes, there sir. was no issue with the vascularity. Yes, and sir. the reflexes you have mentioned is normal? Yes, yes, sir. There was no upper motor neuron signs, so no uh, brisk reflexes. Planters were okay. That we checked thoroughly on the first encounter when the patient had come, just because he had the mid-back pain. So we did not want to miss out any dorsal pathology. So right. clinically, we checked everything on the first go. Physical examination was perfectly okay. The only thing patient had was this mid or lower back pain and radiating to the flank region, okay. which was quite severe. We thought he would be okay with analgesics and some uh, gabapentinoid medication, but he did not become okay. No comorbidities. No comorbidities. 38 year young patient. Obesity was there, but he was tall also. So his BMI must have been 27, 28. Quite on a heavier side, but tall also, sir. So, uh, ideal message is ideally <clears throat> one should also include a peripheral pulses examination, yeah. you know, in the first visit. One should not forget about that. Message should be given. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yes. So, uh, x ray we got done uh, and x ray was okay. I am sorry, I do not have the x ray images right now, but then uh, all together with that, we got an MRI done. And uh, in the MRI at uh, D12 L1 region, especially behind the body of D12, just below the pedicle, we saw that there was some abnormality, some kind of a lesion. And uh, the axial scans revealed that this patient had a space occupying lesion on the right side at uh, behind the body of D12, just below the pedicle. Uh, T2 and T1 weighted images are here. So, so uh, Dheera sir, would you like to comment on Yes, so there is some space uh, occupying lesion and I think, uh, so what they have reported, is it in the epidural space? Uh, sir, they reported that, uh, um, actually speaking, they reported that this is a uh, uh, extradural mass, that is what they reported, right. that this is right. extradural right. lesion Looks and right. uh, probably because of si slight extension into the canal, if you see on the top row, the uh, this section, sir. So with a slight extension into the neural foramen, they reported this to be of the first differential diagnosis they reported was a nerve sheath tumor, a schwannoma or a neurofibroma. That is what they reported, sir. Okay. So it can and... be a nerve sheath tumor. It can be any cystic lesion as well. Yes, sir. Yeah. So it can be arachnoid cyst as well. So yes. we have we should have all these diseases. It can be abscess as well. Mm, correct, sir. 
Yeah. So all these are DDs for this uh, epidural space uh, SOL. Correct, sir. And then with tuberculosis also. Yes. Can be yeah. Epidural abscesses, tuberculosis, pyogenic, anything. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then, uh, so sir, because this could be anything, sir, and a lot of our diagnosis can be clarified with a contrast enhance, at least the infective and the neoplastic or the tumoral etiologies, we could uh, at least confirm or rule out with a contrast image. So right. that One more thing, is, uh, yes. you have whole spine screening as well. Uh, I had, but I did not keep it here, sir. Okay. But I, I so it was clear. Screen. It was clear. Yes, sir. It was clear. And uh, with a young mother, middle age, 38 year old. So it was not on a uh, lower side, but still the... Uh, spine, uh, whole spine screening was clear with no other multiple level lesions or escape lesion was not there, sir. Okay. There, there, are, there, are, there yes, is sir. a layman, I'm just asking. Sir. Yes, sir. No, I'm trying. So, for a beginner, what, what uh, he, he didn't have the x-rays to show. X-rays, what are the specific points in this kind of cases you are going to look for, number one? And number two, uh, does this require a biopsy or anything? Sir, uh, for such such tumors, so it might be a foramen tumor. So there will be increase in size of the foramens on the lateral views. So this is one of the findings in such neurofibromas or schwannomas, which are located in the uh, uh, foramen region. So these are one of the radical. There will be scalloping of the uh, bone uh, or the foramen margins. So this will be one of the finding. Otherwise, uh, on X-ray, it won't be very much obvious. It's hyper intense on T2. So that, that suggests it is a fluid or a cystic lesion or it can be a schwannoma as well. So okay. all these are uh, uh, hyper uh, uh, intense on T2. So uh, this is my initial uh, take on this. Uh, so one more thing I wanted to ask. Uh, so whether there is a myelopathy science or no. So you, uh, you no, have, sir, there myelopathy no. So such lesion, there must be a subtle myelopathy signs, uh, we have to examine this pa such patients uh, very closely. So many patients may not present as a symptoms uh, of myelopathy, but they have very subtle myelopathy signs usually. So these, these we call as asymptomatic myelopathy. So hence on examination, this patient may have a plantar reflex which is upgoing. Just otherwise the tone, everything might be subtle. They may, uh, may not have loss of balance when we ask for but when we test a rhombus or tendon in such patient, they may sometimes have an unsteady or a, a, a loss of balance on these signs. So every time whenever we see such lesions, we, we retrospectively also assess uh, this patient for all these signs. Yeah, you can move ahead. So, sir, in view of that, because we had a long list of differential diagnosis, including a neoplastic or a infective etiology, so we planned for a contrast enhanced image for this patient. So this was the contrast enhancement and we were still further awestruck because now we have a ring like ring like enhancement in the uh, one thing we got confirmed that uh, this is an extradural lesion that we were sure because the first differential diagnosis that the radiologist also gave us was a schwannoma and usually a schwannoma is kind of a tumor which has a part intradural and part extradural extension also going up to the neural foramen. So one thing we were sure with this image was that whatever it is there, it is extradural. That was reported by the radiologist also. So complete extradural, but this had a ring-like enhancement, ring-like ring enhancement around the lesion at the same D12 behind the body of D12, sir. So uh, Dheera, sir, any further clarity that we can get with this? Uh, or, so this ring-like lesion uh, are, uh, is, so, so there is something called as uh, uh, I forgot the word. So on X-rays, on CT, everything is nil. Uh, sometimes on MRI also it is nil. So uh, and only on contrast images such lesions are found as a ring-like lesion. So uh, it is some. It is one of the sign of tuberculoma, spinal tuberculoma, or spinal uh, some granulation tissue uh, uh, in that region, or or an intradural lesion also sometimes present like a ring-like uh, enhancement. So this is one of the DDs with a symptom, uh, uh, clear MRI, clear CT, clear X-ray, but only on contrast, this image is uh, sometimes present. But in this case, we have though uh, on MRI, it was seen and X-ray was clear. So it, it is one of the uh, uh, sign of uh, intra uh, spinal uh, tumor syndrome. This is a terminology which is used.
Yeah, intraspinal tumor syndrome. Yeah. Yeah. Do, does it warrant a biopsy, city guided biopsy or something like that, or or you just explore it and uh, do excisional biopsy? Uh, sir, considering <laughs> the symptoms, uh, and the area, so we won't uh, like to uh, uh, actually intervene if for uh, just for a radiculopathy. In, initially, we'll try to uh, try with a conservative treatment if you want to manage this patient. And if it's not responding, then uh, the other options comes into play. So in that, that case, the block also can be uh, uh, considered in that region, whether to confirm whether this radiating pain is from there itself. And it can be act as a therapeutic uh, modality also. So that will be a second line of treatment. Just for radiating pain, uh, going for a, a, a in surgical exploration won't be recommended in first uh, uh, First, we have to go try with medicines, then a block, then then if not relieved, then uh, option of surgery has to be kept. No, then you will start with the quote anti tubercular treatment now after looking at this. So for this only with radiant pain, I will like to just observe this patient uh, uh, for a while because this is not uh, uh, not a very clear sign of abscess or rest uh, because uh, this is just suggestive of a uh, of a tubercloma, but it's not uh, still I am not sure whether it is. So, Ayush, go ahead. So, so uh, since one of the differential diagnosis is also a spinal epidural abscess, which uh, can be quite clear with laboratory parameters like spinal epidural abscess or pyogenic or tubercular will have raised ESR, CRP. And even in uh, if it is a pyogenic, we can have a high TLC count in the range of 18 or 20,000. So, the laboratory parameters were normal or, and neither were there the clinical features like any fever, or any constitutional symptoms. So one thing is that laboratory parameters being normal, again, it made us think more in the line of either it can be a extradural uh, tumor of the spine or maybe something else. So uh, this is what a diagnosis we made, sir. Uh, D12 L1 extradural lesion compressing the thecal sac and the D12 nerve root causing a severe D12 radiculopathy without any neurological deficit or bladder involvement. Uh, query schwannoma or even it can be an extruded disc prolapse or a epidural abscess. So, uh, and then we did a little a bit of literature search also. So we saw some case reports uh, uh, of an extradural schwannoma because most of the reported schwannomas will have a intradural extension and uh, some literature reviews showed that schwannoma usually comprise, uh, it's a common kind of a intraspinal tumor. And approximately 70%, 75% are intradural, 10% are combined intra-extradural, and only 15% are, are extradural. But purely extradural schwannoma is quite a rare entity. And these are the types of schwannoma. Uh, here we can see type 1 to 6, 5 and 6 are intraosseous schwannomas, where they, uh, erode, uh, they primarily originate from the bone. And uh, type 1 is the primary, mostly within the canal. Type 2 has is a dumbbell-shaped schwannoma, which is, uh, it, which is in the spinal canal as well as extending to neural foramen. Type 3 has most of the uh, most of the component of the schwannoma is extraspinal. So uh, here we thought it can be a type 1 schwannoma according to the classification. And then the other uh, DD was a thoracic disc herniation, which is again a rare area for a disc prolapse to happen. Most of the disc prolapse happens in the lumbar or the cervical spine. Only 1% of the herniated nucleus uh, pulposus the disc prolapse happens in the thoracic spine. and But again, it is most commonly seen in the fourth and sixth decades of life, which is the case in our patient. And D11, T12 is the most common level. So one of the DDs could have been a thoracic disc herniation. Again, coming to spinal epidural abscess, it is a challenging diagnosis because of its rarity, uh, because it's found in 0.2 to 2.8% of 10,000 hospital admissions. But uh, initially, the case was uh, spinal epidural abscesses were highly fatal infections and their mortality uh, being as high as 34% in late 1950s. But with the advent of newer antibiotics and anti-tubercular therapies, the mortality has now significantly decreased, although it is still considered a quite a grave kind of a lesion if happens to uh, happen to a patient. And... Uh, it was said that the problem with spinal epidural abscess is not the treatment, but the early diagnosis before any massive neurological symptoms occurred. But because these abscesses can grow in no, no time, and then previously asymptomatic or subtle symptoms 
of the patient could become grave symptoms within a few days or even few hours. So, sir, Dira, sir, uh, and yeah. uh, the panel, everybody. So, what uh, would you like to do, sir? So, I'll give you the scenario of this patient, sir. He had problems since three months when he came to us. Already taken some kind or the other of painkiller with the local pharmacy or the local doctors. Then came to us. We also reassured him, don't worry. Take conservative management from our side, what our protocol is. Take this. And we gave him the treatment for four to six weeks. But then he came back to us within two weeks and said that my problem is significant. My report, MRI report says query tumor, query infection, sir. So I, you tell me what this is and treat me properly for this condition. So this is mainly a radiological kind of diagnosis for me right now. So I will need a radiologist also in my team and I have to discuss with them what, what they are... Uh, edging towards more. So if they are uh, erring towards more uh, for an infection point of view, then uh, then uh, I will like to take a biopsy like that. Maybe uh, if they is they are confident, they can take a CT guided biopsy if possible. Yeah. Otherwise, um, if they are not uh, not going towards, uh, they are going towards the nerve sheet tumors or schwannoma, then in that case, I will go uh, slowly with a conservative treatment. Got it. You know, one point I should uh, highlight here, <clears throat> as an orthopedic surgeon, whenever we are sending this patient for city-guided biopsy, it is preferable that you must be there in the city console to guide the, you know, radiologist that from where to take the biopsy. Right. Okay, then the yield is much better and the positive results are much better. This is one thing I have learned over a period of time. Yes. Rather than telling them to take a biopsy because they don't know what is the, they just find that somewhere and most of the time CT guided biopsy will become negative. So as an orthopedic surgeon, let us go to the console and guide them that from here to take the biopsy, here is the abscess, here is the, from here you take the biopsy yes. and from, okay, that, that is important. Yeah, I will I like, so I like to add two things. So uh, for second thing, uh, they, the, uh, the sepsis part, we take better care in the CT room. Yeah. The contamination chances reduces drastically when an orthopedic surgeon is uh, there in the CT console room. And uh, the second thing, the size of needle, many times they use a very FNAC biopsy needle, a very thinner yeah. one. And many times it's inconclusive. So yeah. we prefer to take a bigger wide bore needles in such areas. Uh, so that's the second thing we, we uh, add to the uh, biopsy and the positivity rate can be increased. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I just go ahead, please. So, sir, uh, contrary to the uh, opinion of the panel, we uh, actually, the patient was quite skeptical. He was young also. He said that, uh, the, can this be tumor? Can this be infection? Tell me. So, we thought then, again, we told the patient, yes, the only way to be 100% sure, not even 100%, but to be sure is that we take a piece of your whatever is there, send it to lab for test. So, we explained him that a biopsy is the one thing that will be conclusive. And he was uh, okay with that, that he said, Ki, okay, I'm ready. I want a further clarification of what this thing is. And uh, he was not so much bothered about the symptom, but then the diagnosis that you have to tell me, doctor, can it be tumor? Can it be infection? So what we planned is there was two options. One is because the lesion is very small, we could go for an excisional biopsy, that is, remove it, send it to lab and find out or a needle or a core or the CT guided biopsy. So we discussed the options with the patient. Patient said that, okay, if it is uh, possible, you can remove it. So uh, we went for an excisional biopsy only, sir. So we did a minimally invasive laminate uh, decompression and removal of the mass. So the, to re relieve the compression on the root and the quad. We kept the instrumentation as backup because this was conus level, sir. So we did not want to so much retract the uh, dura or the spinal cord. Uh, so we had to burn quite a significant part of the facet. So we thought uh, we would put a screw. This I do not have actually the intraop images, but this was the way we approached. A tubular, minimally invasive approach was done. Laminotomy was done, uh, and we had to remove part of the facet also. And then we removed this extradural mass, and uh, this was our thecal sac, the disc space from where uh, it was. Uh, extradural mass, we removed it. We prophylactically stabilized because we burned the facet. 
just unilateral fixation, which in future, if required, we can remove also just to preserve the motion of the segment. And uh, clinically, it appeared to be like a disc only, sir. Okay. Disc fragment. Good. And uh, then we said, uh, this was the patient. Next day, he was up and about, sir, ready to be discharged. So patient was also not so much in distress. He was also happy. And then finally, uh, within four or five days, we got our report that this was a degenerated intervertebral disc, sir. Okay. So finally, the excisional biopsy and the laboratory confirmation gave us a confirmation that this was nothing but an extruded thoracic disc. And uh, this was sir, just done for academic purposes. It, was, it is not a routine that we do. Not yeah. all patients undergoing any surgery is, uh, we, it's not our protocol. But then for academic purpose, we got a confirmatory MRI done for this patient two weeks post-op when he came to us for suture removal. Uh, because the patient was type A personality type that he was like, okay, is this everything? So we got an MRI done just to show and we document that, yes, we have removed whatever it was and the report has come out to be a disc prolapse only. So no tumor, no infection, no further treatment is needed once and for all. We have undergone this thing. Sir. Okay. Good. So, is the, what is the follow-up now? Sir, the follow-up is six, uh, five weeks follow-up, sir. This was a case done in December. Great. His symptoms have uh, disappeared now. Yes, the, the pain, um, initially first few days, he had the surgical side pain only, sir. But that the one that going that was going below the subcostal region, the flank region, and his uh, pain is everything is okay, sir. Nice. Great, Great case. Good. Dheeraj, you are concluding remarks for this case. Oh, no, so they have managed it really well and it was a very interesting case uh, to present. Uh, so at the end, nobody was sure what it was and it came out to be an extruded disc. So good job at that. Thank you. But then uh, the, the, these uh, discs, then why did it light up on the contrast? Do they do that normally? Yes, sir. So uh, what uh, what assumption we are making is probably this was a fresh disc extrusion and this could be an inflammatory reaction, sir. No, but because, okay. uh, also why they should be uh, having a rim sign uh, 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 around there. It should okay. be inflammation doesn't have vascularity every time around the disc. No. Granulation on T2, I can understand there may be edema around. But why on contrast, uh, the contrast only will take uh, uh, vessels No. Yes, sir. This was the only reason why we had so much confusion that this can be an epidural abscess or a yeah. tuberculoma because of this ring-like enhancement. But finally, the gross pathology and the histopathology both both came out to be a That's weird. Right. So thank this, you. This this was the controversy and challenges. In, in thank you, thank you. I also this case also worth you know publishing it as a case report. Maybe with a little follow up, you can publish it after a couple of months or a year or so. Right. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, I would like to you. thank Dr. Sharma, which is who is my senior at knee and spine and Apollo clinics with whom I was there in this case. Sir. Okay. okay. We thank Dr. Gaurav as well for permitting us to discuss about this case. Right, thank you, Diraj, for uh, you know generating discussion on this case. So let's uh, you know move on to our uh, last uh, case presentation today. So our last presenter today is uh, Dr. Vishnu Senthil, who is uh, assistant professor at the Government uh, Rapid Hospital, Kilpok Medical College, Chennai. And Dr. Vishnu has got a specialization in trauma, orthoplasty, put and ankle, pediatric hip, and orthobiologics as well. And Dr. Vishnu has been very active and a young orthopedic surgeon in the Young Orthopedic Surgeons Group of Indian Orthopedic Association also. Welcome, Dr. Vishnu. And uh, I'll be moderating this case. Of course, with me, Dr. Asis, Dr. Dheeraj, and uh, Dr. Deepak, they are there. Other people are also there. You know, orthoplasty is now everybody's... Uh, you know, play on the everybody's platter. So let's uh, go ahead. Uh, Vishnu, please go ahead with presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the introduction, sir. I'll just uh, share yeah. my screen. Sir, good evening, sir. This is a uh... Just a case management of a developmental dysplasia of hip. 
and i'll just proceed to the case sir a yeah. 22 year old 28 year old female presented with uh, bilateral ddh and she had a dysplastic astabulum with coxa valga bilaterally and so this is the x ray which uh, she presented sir so she was uh, walking with an antalgic gait and uh, she had more uh, symptoms on right side compared to the left side and uh, so it was at uh, 288 uh, 28 eight, 8 years so she wanted a, a pain free mobile and stable hip sir so this so, is the x ray presentation so was he, he was she was painful yes sir she was painful yeah and with the right side more than left side sir yeah so the first message is in dysplastic hips unless the hip is painful though the x ray looks bad one should not jump to the surgery so since it is painful, so it has to be intermittent. Okay. Now, what next? Yeah. So next we have taken a pelvis X-ray, sir. Then femur X-ray. So we went our management option was to do a total hip arthroplasty, sir, with the available implants. And the one thing about in this type of cases is we should take a femur X-ray and also we should arrange for a proper armamentarium regarding uh, cup size and uh, femoral, uh, femoral stem size uh, because the smallest uh, cup size and stem size is needed and also we should have a revision system and also a uh, type of SROM stem where we can modulate both uh, proximally and uh, distally, sir. So uh, uh, tell us your plan. What uh, what uh, What is the plan? How you are going to plan, uh, put the socket and uh, how you are going to restore the center of rotation and all? So our initial plan is, so from this X-ray, we can see that the astabulum is shallow, sir. So mm. we have to first deepen the astabulum, medialize it. What is this type? The, there is a crow classification for this. Yes, sir. It's it's a crow, crow type. More of crow, four, sir, three to four. Uh, how do you decide that? That depending upon the subluxation, yeah, sir. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just tell that for the uh, benefit of the viewers. That uh, if case of unilateral DDH, in case of unilateral DDH, you see that what is the head neck junction and how far it has moved away from the you know teardrop, the lower margin of the teardrop, how far it has moved up, and what percentage of the normal head's diameter it has moved up, head neck junction. So if it is uh, you know less than uh, fifty percent, then we tell type 1, if it is you know, 50 to 75, type 2, 75 to 100, type 3, more than 100 is type 4. But in this kind of cases where there are bilateral cases where head is deformed and both the you know sides are involved, here the height of the pelvis, 20% of the height of the pelvis is taken as the head diameter. Okay, that roughly corresponds. The height of the pelvis means you measure the you know, supra, uh, in this ileum, both the ileum, tip of the ileum, you draw the line and both the ischium, you draw the line and they take the 20%, that is the height of the head and how far it has displaced from the teardrop uh, tells you the, you know, type. It may be type 2 on one side, type 3 on the other side, like that. So, which side you operated first? Uh, we operated only on uh, right side, sir. Right side, yeah. So, right side looks like it may be type three it looks like type three in yes. type three do you like to restore the center of rotation anatomic center of rotation sir we can uh, try to achieve as much as possible sir uh, the uh, even high hip center also is uh, acceptable in uh, yeah um, that, these types of cases yeah that is the correct thing that in type one and type four type one is the type 4, these are the two thing, two scenarios where you try to restore the anatomic center of rotation. Type 4 requires a subtrochantric osteotomy and you bring the anatomic restore. And whereas in type 2 and type 3, you accept a high center of rotation. Usually, you know, how much uh, high center of rotation, how far it is acceptable? That is within 3 centimeters, not yes. beyond that. If it goes beyond three centimeters, then you may land up in a in a less of bone stock in the ileum and all their uh, cup placement will fail. Okay. So now what you do? Oh, vestibulum side. 
you will read so can you also highlight the, the challenges on the femoral side yeah challenges on the femoral side yeah vishnu okay i'll, sir, I'll, I'll side... yeah you you tell i'll i'll add, add to that sir femoral side uh, challenges that uh, we have the stem size sir because the calf car canal ratio will be very small and uh, so we should have the smallest uh, size of uh, stems and sometimes because these bones are will be much osteoporotic so periprosthetic fractures are uh, much more common and uh, yeah. cemented backup is also needed sir and uh, to have a periprosthetic plates if wiring set everything cables everything is also should be kept as a backup sir if there is any fractures exactly because during reduction and uh, there may be uh, fractures are possible sir because of the osteoporotic and uh, Reduction, okay. sir. So, and the astabular, be... yeah, yeah. I, I'll tell you on the astabular side. So, there looks seems to be a good bone stock. So, if you go on reaming there, you'll get a good coverage at the astabulum. Suppose you have reached the floor of the astabulum and uh, you do not get a good coverage, then you may put bone grafters uh, from the head there and then put the cup in. Because here in these cases, the anteroposterior diameter of the acetabulum is less compared to the superior inferior diameter of the acetabulum. Yes. And your cup size depends on the anteroposterior capture. So, AP capture. So, AP uh, diameter decides about the size of the cup. So, if uh, after AP capture, if you see there is superiorly there is some deficiency, you can fill up with bone graft. So, on the femoral side, again, the AP you know, diameter is less than the mediolateral diameter. Okay. AP diameter is less than the mediolateral diameter, as you can see in the X-ray, what is seen. And there will be antiversion. There are a lot of antiversion. So, in order to adjust that, that's why you rightly told that you should keep SRAM stems uh, there, so that where you can adjust the version, or else what uh, Vishnu rightly told, you can have a cemented option standby. Because in cemented heap, you can adjust the version easily or in the SRAM stem. These are the two options which can be used. And uh, since the canal is narrow, where you can use a CDH cemented stem or in SRAM system, the smallest diameter stem which is available is 6 millimeter. So you can use a 6 millimeter stem until in this kind of cases. So the version is more and canal is narrow. And uh, that's why you have to keep cemented as well as, you know, SRAM options uh, there. Yeah, please go ahead. So, this is the CT of the pelvis, sir. Yeah. Asis, you will do a CT in all these cases? What do you do in your dysplastic cases? You are muted. You have to unmute. Yeah, so sorry, sir. My volumes are very uh, low and I do this very infrequently. So out of uh, this thing, curiosity to uh, know the anteroposterior capture, as you mentioned, whether I'll be able to get the smallest size cup uh, or so, we would get a CT. But what I would also do is, uh, because our numbers are so low and we are not that experienced, is probably get it 3D printed. Okay. So on a few oh. occasions we have got it 3D printed and we have sort of you know done a mock drill of where my acetabular cup and my reamers are going to go. And you know that sort of reassures us that okay, uh, we can get the smallest size stems, smallest size cups in, and this is the extent of uncoverage that I can expect intraoperatively without breaching the middle wall or things like that. that. That's a very good point, actually. In fact, for beginners, at least those who are doing less frequently or are... You know, uh, so you can do a 3D model of this, which is easily now available 3D printed model, which costs hardly, I think, uh, seven, eight thousand rupees for a pelvis model. And you can do a mock drill and see that uh, what size of cup is fitting in, how you are going to put bone grafts, etc., before going for surgery. Isn't it? That's that's an important thing. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those cities it may be required, but nowadays, once uh, you get experience, you may, may not do a CT in this kind of cases. You should have the smallest cough available, even if you have a CT scan. Yeah. Don't have that implant. Yeah. Many times, the company people, they don't keep small yeah. size coughs. They start with 46, you know, 48 like that. So, you tell them that uh, at least they should keep 42 coughs available. Many companies they have 42 cups available in their system. 
but you have to tell them specifically to keep the 42 cups and keep cemented standby also in case it's a 40 cup then you have to use a cemented cup there isn't it Vishnu? yes sir. yeah right got it go ahead please So that is a pre op gate. Yes, sir. No, that's very painful, yeah. Okay. So these are the moments, sir. Drop moments. Mm -hmm. So there was a Abduction deformity, sir, and uh, adduction was uh, free adduction is there, and these mm -hmm. are the intraoperative that is before uh, operation. These are the movements in table, and these are the rotations, mm -hmm. which are full, sir. So okay. with this, uh, so intraoperatively we used a uh, approach. Approach in this uh, type of case is the posterior posterior approach, sir. Mm -hmm. Then uh, we have the femoral head uh, was dislocated. Uh, with the standard uh, manner and uh, head, uh, head was uh, removed. And now the first thing was we address the astablum. Since the astablum was shallow and dysplastic, so in this uh, in this case, the transverse astablum ligament was easily identified. So this transverse astablum ligament with the help of a long artery, so we just uh, roll over, over the inferior wall of the astablum, we can find the transverse astablum ligament with keeping that as a Landmark and small size reamer initially was used, and initially we medialized the medialization of the wall was done, and reaming till the, the near the teardrop and, and to confirm it was confirmed with the fluoroscopy, and we didn't want to deepen very much so that uh, because she's a young lady and uh, further she may need also revision so too much of bone stock bone stock also we should use and uh, the same as. Like sir said, the anterior posterior capture was achieved initially, but the superior capture uh, could not be achieved. So we took the bone graft, which was the help of the femoral head, which was taken as a bone graft. And uh, initially it was uh, stabilized with the K wire, then it was anchored with uh, two screws, then the reaming was uh, completed. An uncemented uh, cup with the three point fixation, uncemented uh, cup was uh, placed. And next was uh, the thing was next important challenge was the stem. Stem was an important challenge. And uh, this was case was done in my uh, fellowship period. So at that time, the, they, they couldn't, uh, it was done in a government hospital. So they couldn't have the enormous armamentarium where the, the availability of the SROM stems or modular stems and cemented stem was not there as a backup. So whichever was available, with the, with the implant company, which was available, and the smaller size, uncemented stem was uh, considered and uh, and reaming and broaching was done and uncemented uh, stem was uh, fitted in. And so with the smallest amount of stem, the reduction was very much difficult. So in order to, and since there was also abduction deformity, and in order to reduce the hip, we had, uh, we had to do the releases with the, we have to do, we have to go anteriorly, the anterior capsule, and along with the uh, surrounding structures was uh, released, along with the soft tissue, the iliosoas was released, and the gluteus maximus in insertion, the anterior middle fibers, which was which was released, and also the abductor IT band uh, tethering was done to aid in uh, reduction, but still the reduction was tight. So in this, so next we went, so we did was a trochanteric osteotomy. So trochanteric vasectomy was done along with the gluteus medius fibers, and the reduction was achieved. And uh, then once the reduction was achieved and uh, combined antiversion was uh, satisfactory, then the trochanteric osteotomy was fixed with the help of uh, K wires, and it was fixed with two screws. And SS wire was done to for the trochanteric wiring for additional uh, stability. And a mild amount of abduction deformity was still present. So distally, the IT band was released at the distal insertion, also with the minimum of three, mm, three centimeter insertion with the adductor percutaneous tenotomy was done. And finally, the reduction was done. And this is the, but post-operative peroneal palsy was present. 
and so this is the post operative exercise sir sir your comments sir yeah no nicely done but uh, thing is that when there is abduction deformity why did you do adductor anatomy yes sir we shouldn't do but uh, in this case uh, it was uh, because uh, there, there was tight adductors so it was adductor anatomy was done sir but generally in abduction we should have adductor anatomy should be avoided yeah and it may not be required because adductors yes, are yes. stressed stressed out okay no nicely done case so uh, just couple of uh, you know points about uh, this bulk uh, graft how to fix this bulk grafts so after you put your trial cup in after you got a ap capture then you prepare this graft from the head you split the head take out the cartilage whatever possible and save the graft according to the defect which is present on the super posterior super aspect or super aspect of the you know acetabulum so you have to hold the graft temporarily with k wire and uh, the screws should be passed in the direction of the trabeculae of the ilium which is towards the si joints okay so that gives you a better graft uptake and no part of the graft should be extending or projecting beyond the margin of the cup if any graft part of the graft if it is unloaded beyond the margin of the cup that graft will get absorbed in the later on and when the graft part of the graft gets absorbed the screws become loose and screws becomes and that graft fails that is how it has been told that you know grafts have got a long term failure rates but uh, if you do it technically in a proper way you know we have seen grafts take up is quite good so screws should be directed towards the si joint no part of the graft should be projected beyond the margin of the cup that means graft should be loaded then only this graft is going to unite and the cancellous part should be exposed towards the cancellous bone opposed there then of course after fixing the graft temporarily with k wire then finally you put the cup final cup in and do whatever fixation and then you put the screws in one one by taking out one k wire out k wire out you put a one screw then take out the other k wire and fix with one screw and it is a stable fixation if the screws are loose or not tightened then enough that means graft is not compressed then this graft is going to get absorbed in due course and uh, uh, usually they do not require a trochanteric osteotomy part all they require they require a soft trochanteric osteotomy might be if there is tightness in the reduction i would have done a soft trochanteric osteotomy reduced it and uh, excised a part of the you know head and uh, then uh, you know put it in the distal fragment which hardly takes another 15 minutes or so sir generally yeah. we, uh, how uh, how often you go for a soft trochanteric osteotomy sir not not very often it, it you know if it is crow type 4 then directly i go for soft trochanteric this was most likely crow type 3 crow type 3 is little dicey so on the table we decide if we are not able to reduce don't give too much of traction to reduce the hip when you give too much of traction like this in a nerve palsy occurs post operatively because if you are lengthening the limb beyond 4 cm then there are chances of uh, you know nerve injury is there and these are usually traction nerve injury and uh, difficult to improve because traction nerve injury is the uh, the blood supply to the nerve that is a vasa nervorum that gets affected and when vasa nervorum gets affected they do not recover completely they recover but uh, they may not recover completely that is the some fibers you know uh, there will be partial recovery so which implant had to used in this case what is this So this was done a little much before, sir. So I'm, I'm not. I think it's uh, a locally manufactured implant. Yes, it's not a. Yeah. Not it's a good. standardized. Uh, hmm. So what made you to go for a trochanteric osteotomy here in this? Mainly part? the trochanteric osteotomy. We went because there was difficulty in reduction, sir. It's you are not. Difficulty able... in reduction. I be doctor so at tight. So, so in that uh, even that case, uh, if you do a three hundred degree release leaving the abductors. It's advisable not to touch the abductors as much as possible. Yeah, better to be soft trochanteric so and preserve the abductors because once again the young patient, you know, walking and dejecting, the screws over there, 
Subcontinent bursitis, tegel things, they are very common. Sir, but if you we want to go for subcontinent osteotomy again, we need that uh, modular type of implants, no, sir. Okay, now I was just going to put that part. Uh, Dr. Mahanti, how often if you have used a conventional uh, conventional implant in a subcostotomy? No, so we can use conventional implant also. We have used uh, coral stem in, you know, yeah. uh, in subcostotomy osteotomy because this uh, small size coral stem, size 6, sometimes size, it is uh, used. Size. Thing is that in the distal fragment, the purchase has to be good. There should be a good scratch fit in the distal fragment. Mm. If it is not, then it is preferable to use a plate. Laterally. Seeing this implant particularly, na, I think you could have tried for uh, that subprocastrotum age Yeah, so, yeah, again, yeah. Good fitting, good size stem. So it's a nice system, I feel. And yeah. could have got a good uh, rotational stability for the distal fragment as well. Additionally, you could have uh, used a plate if required. And that segment of bone which you take out, you can use it as a graft. You can split it yeah. and put it uh, that around that osteotomy side and do a wearing of that graft. Yeah. You, you, have case, actually, you have a follow-up? A follow-up, follow no, sir. Patient was uh, lost in follow-up, sir. But in this case, uh, we are not planned for a subprogrammatic osteotomy. So we yeah, thought that... initially we can go for a reduction and finally after releasing, we were not able to reduce them. Uh, the abductors were still tight. So we didn't want to release more of the abductors. So we went for a trochanteric osteotomy and reduced and uh, fixed it, sir. Yeah, yeah, it has been lengthened. Okay, it's it's lengthened quite a more. You can see the level. Yes, of the center at the level. So that is why the traction type of uh, this yeah. the peroneal palsy is there. Yeah, yeah, and uh, of course, if you do the opposite side, that uh, you know that will get compensated to a certain extent. That's not an issue. Okay. Anything else? Any any literature you have? Anything? Nothing, sir. Only that uh, in this the uh, hip center alone, uh, as you told, it should we should uh, yeah. make sure that uh, that they also we have to take into consideration, sir. And 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 I have tell that if you could have brim little bit more, you could have yes. medialized the cup, yes. then yes, uh, uncoverage of the cup would have been much less. So maybe uh, graft might not have been required. So if you say you have got a good sixty percent host bone contact, then you may not use a graft. Okay. That, Sir, if we need for uh, further revisions and the, the time. Uh, yeah, that is okay. But initially, if you have restored the center of rotation to anatomic location, it, it it will have a good long term outcome rather than requiring early revision. Okay. Okay. Otherwise, it uh, looks good. Graft has been fixed well. Yeah. Let's let's see the follow up. Always in Arthroplast, we need a follow up. No, no, how, yes, for, okay, how is it? Because uh, afterwards, when he starts walking and all this abduction deformity will get corrected, that that will take almost you know, three to six months for this deformity to get corrected in order to bring the limb to neutral position. Okay. okay. Yeah. I think we are running you know, out of time. We're almost half an hour, 25 minutes uh, late. No problem. Uh, we had a nice discussion today and uh, thank you uh, Dr. Pratik Tiwari, Dr. Ayush Aryal and uh, Dr. Uh, Vishnu Santhil being the opening batsman for the show. And, thank you, sir. Uh, great cases. Even, even uh, personally, I gained a lot uh, in this uh, small, small, little, little points from Pratik's case, Ayush's case and Vishnu's case also that also remains and uh, we thank uh, Dr. Asis Pandis, Dr. Uh, you know, Diraj Sonavane for devoting their time for being the expert, uh, giving their expert opinion. And we thank uh, Ortho TV also, uh, Dr. Ashok Sham, Dr. Niraj Pijlani, and Poonam also. And now I hand over to Deepak to give the concluding remarks and about the next episode. Yeah, Deepak. Deepak. Second uh, oh, episode is very interesting. So uh, I would like to invite all the young orthopedic surgeons to participate in this forum. Present your case, learn, make us learn, share your knowledge. We'll be again back after two weeks uh, with a different theme. Uh, most probably it will be in arthroscopy, tumor, or uh, pediatric orthopedics. Uh, for today, I'd like to thank you all the speakers, panel members. 
and uh, keep watching Ortho TV and we'll be coming up with a new uh, new and newer theme so that more and more orthopedic surgeons will be connected throughout out of the world. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, sir. Thank, nice you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.